Cameron Crow and Kyle Arnold here. We're going to talk about Kyle's experience at Coal Valley, but first things first, if this is the first interview you've seen, um, I'm going to do a little intro. If it's not, then you know the, you know the trick, just skip ahead. Um, so I, I wrote a blog post two and a half months ago, uh, I think now, and it's about my high school and how basically over the course of the almost 11 years since I graduated there, how my memories have shifted and how I was maybe one of the biggest, you know, proponents of Coal Valley Christian and now how I feel like I'm one of the biggest critics of Coal Valley Christian. Um, and, and I felt strongly about um, how negative that environment is for a lot of reasons. And I felt like I needed to get off my chest. It might mean something to somebody and that's a good enough reason to, to share it. So um, I posted it and it exploded. My phone was um, on fire for days and days and days. And lots of people like, how dare you? How, be how could you do this, betray me? Um, we loved you, Cameron. How could you say something bad about this school? I, just, I was like, well, yes, <laughs> there's a lot of good things that happen, but that's not what people need to hear um, about. Um, and anyway, and then a bunch of people that were like, Cameron, you've got, you have no idea. This is what happened to me. And I was like, whoa. After a little while, I was like, I can't be this person for everybody. We need a place where people can talk and, and support each other. So we created a support group on Facebook. Um, people started flocking to it. Um, I think in its first week, we probably had 80 people in it. We've got 150 now. Um, and that's full of students, parents, um, and past staff. Um, so tons and tons of tons of stories. And eventually we realized um, we needed to kind of make this a bigger thing. We created a website um, called coalvalleyspeaks.com. And it has all the public content. A lot of the stuff in the support group is private because not everybody's comfortable kind of sharing what happened to them um, openly. Some of these people had shared it for the very first time in that group. Um, really traumatic stuff like suicide attempts, rapes, all kinds of heart-wrenching and disturbing things. So, um, but some people have um, volunteered to share this stuff publicly, and that's what you see here. Um, so Kyle's one of those brave souls. Um, it's going to take a stand. And, um, and then we also realized that we needed to not only kind of vent and talk about what happened and the problems that, that we experienced, but also we should do something. You know, this is, these are things are probably at the time we thought theoretically still happening. Um, and now we have confirmation that they're still happening. Um, but we like, maybe we could do something about it. Maybe we could be a part of the solution. So we, over 20 people came together and shared their stories and wrote, took the time and wrote. And after a hundred hours of work, we created this document called that we call the joint statement. Um, and it has, we, we've categorized all of these problems and used stories and quotations and found the themes and recommended solutions, really trying to do all the homework we possibly could to help the school make it really easy to, to move the needle on a lot of these issues. Um, and that this was a very you know, good faith effort to be a part of the solution, not just vent, which is I think a lot of sentiment that people are like, oh, they just wanna, they're just a bunch of whiny people that want to, you know, talk about how the school ruined their lives. Um, um, but no, we want to make some of these things better. And if you actually care about the health and safety of kids, then you should want to make these improvements yourself. So that is the context. And Kyle, to kick things off, how about you? What was it when? So you what were you first exposed to about all of this? Was it, was it the blog post, you know, and when you saw this stuff, you know, what started going through your mind? Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I saw your blog post right away. I had actually been at least keeping up with your seemingly good public works in the Boise area. And so <laughs> like I was, you know, an active reader of the content that you were already posting and then you hit it with this blog post and, you know, a lot of people, have been talking about stuff like this for years. And it was just kind of a, oh, wow, here it goes. I don't know that he, I didn't think that you really grasped the can of worms you had opened. 
and you know how many discontent people there are out there but uh i think it was good i think it needs to happen and excited for what's happening with it so and not only have you been excited about it and supportive but you've also been following it very closely you were telling me before we started recording that you watched most of mm -hmm. most of the interviews yeah and so I've been a pretty silent supporter. You know, I'm in the support group now. Originally, I wasn't. I joined it after the uh, support group had a meeting next door to where I live here. And I showed I up. and I got dragged in. <laughs> well, I showed up and a lot of people were just like, I had no idea you were on board. I, you know, we haven't seen you in 10 years, you know. But every time you post a new one, I go into it hoping that people had a good experience, but expect horror stories. And that's kind of just what, the norm has been as far as other people sharing their experiences that there's a lot of good times at Cold Alley, but there's also a lot of really terrible things that happened or are associated or just, you know, pe people who have been long since removed from the equation that, you know, that, that sticks to the memory. And so that's kind of why I jumped in is that I personally had a good experience and didn't hate my time at Cold Alley, but I recognize the the need for this because um, something that hit me really hard is actually at that first meeting, another student from my class looked right at me and said, I hated you in high school. And all I could do was go, yep, I understand. That makes sense. You know, I don't blame you. Hopefully I'm not that guy. <laughs> but it was kind of like, yeah, no, I can't can't deny it. You know, if you're not part of the solution you're part of the problem so I wanted to be part of the solution so now I'm trying <laughs> I I'm, I've had that feeling too I mean I real I was a bully to a lot of people um, mm -hmm. and several of the support stories in the support group have been about me mm -hmm. the things that I did that uh, that traumatized people and you know really affected their lives um, and in a negative way. And that's very humbling. And, um, and it's one thing that makes this whole movement very complex. Um, um, you know, some, some of the people that, you know, in the, some stories are the victims are in other stories are the villains and, um, you know, might have been trying to help and then, you know, end up hurting. And, and that's, that's kind of a theme with everybody, including the teachers that, you know, they were, they were there for some kids and they weren't there for other kids. And, and this is, um, there's a lot of blame to go around. Like very, probably very few people are, are totally blameless, but some, you know, got the brunt of it much more than others. Um, yeah. and, um, so, so Kyle, maybe you could give us a little background, like what, how many years did you go to Coal Valley? What class were you? Um, okay, yeah, sure. Anything that kind of is, you know, in that kind of overview narrative is worth kind of mentioning. You know, you were big in sports. Maybe you could talk about that. Yeah. So I attended Coal Valley 13 years. I graduated in 2007. And I had four siblings who also attended Coal Valley, at least for a good while. Um, I'm the one that Eagle Valley. Both my oldest siblings graduated at Eagle. My middle brother came back from Eagle to graduate at Cole Valley, and the youngest uh, bounced around all sorts of middle schools and junior highs, and then ended up back at Cole Valley eventually after he got to the high school level. And Cole was actually offering the support he needed, which uh, so I had a a long history starting in probably 1994 to 2007 ish. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you played sports? Yep. So I was, uh, I mean, basketball, K through graduation. I never got in on the football train. My, my mother was actually pretty opposed to football. She wouldn't even let my older brother, who a lot of people on here know or knew my older brother, and he's a, a big guy that should have been playing football, and that was, like, not okay in our house. But We need every large, large boy we can get on the team. To get abused, yeah. <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah. so I never jumped on the football train, but I was a participant in things like choir. Um, I kind of took a keep my head down approach throughout high school, so I never put myself in the 
the public with like student office or anything like that. I avoided that kind of stuff. I was a good student, but I wasn't involved in an NHS. Like, so I just, I don't know. I tended to do my best to stay popular because that's what high school is all about is being popular, but also fly under the radar and avoid the, the, str the stringent eye of administrators. You know, I wanted them to look at me in a good light. Uh, it was very important to me to leave a good first impression on people. And uh, that, that rang true all throughout my years at Coal Valley. But, Explain this stringent eye of administration. Um, so how can I explain this? There's basically, I'm going to call it, or a phrase I like to use is Coal Valley privilege levels. And so at the absolute top tier, you know, 10 out of 10 Coal Valley privilege, you have administrators, children, people who have parents on the board that also happen to be athletic, get good grades. The, those kids are top tier, you know, Coal Valley privilege. I was probably an eight or a nine on the Coal Valley privilege scale where my parents weren't directly involved, but they were really involved. They had sway at the school and I was never class president or anything, but you know, I was playing on the varsity basketball team. I, I was the kind of student that they would put in the newsletter, you know, like, so, and then, you know, for every one student that you have like that, you have 20 students whose parents aren't as involved or aren't associated with the school that don't get away with nearly as much. Um, you know, I tell people often that I basically had high school down to a science by the time I was a senior, where I knew how to game the system and how to stay in the good graces of the administrators and the Lord, you know, and uh, I don't know, I could give a million examples, everything from how to get an extra day for a test you didn't study for to, you know, getting out of going to an event that you don't want to go to. You know, there's, there's a million examples I could give. Or the, a really simple one is just walking down the hall between classes. I was the kind of student that a teacher wouldn't think twice, wouldn't even ask me what I was doing. Didn't, I'd never once heard, where's your hall pass? Where are you going? That kind of stuff. You know, just because, oh, that, that's a good old boy. Kyle's, you know, he's, he's probably not up to anything bad. So, you know, this sounds like an ebook that people would pay for. <laughs> I don't know about that. But <laughs> How to win at high school. Yeah, right. No, I've, I've often thought about stuff like that, where it's just like, it's not necessarily that I was, you know, the best student that got the best grades or the greatest athlete. It was just that I had learned to game the system through my many years in the system. And so, I don't know. I feel like that's, there's a lot of that at Cole Valley. People both administrators, teachers, and students who kind of take advantage of it, so. So <clears throat> you knew how to gain the system and you knew how to stay, you know, have keep your standing. Um, exactly. But at the same time, you know, benefit from it, you know, get some extra slack. Were you actually doing like, you know, bad things that you were able to kind of sneak under the radar? Oh, uh, let's see, I'd say the worst thing that I would do often my senior year is the varsity squad for basketball had the 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. practice time slot in the new gym. And in order to keep my perfect attendance on the basketball team and my perfect starter record, I would show up, go to practice, get to about 7.50 and think, gosh, school doesn't sound good today. I'm going to go home. And so I would. I'd just go home. On my way home, I'd call the office and call them and we'd time. <laughs> So that, so that's you like, out for a second. What did you say? You, I, you don't feel good or something? Yeah, exactly. You just, oh, I'm just not feeling it. My stomach's upset, whatever, you know, on my way home. And that was, that was acceptable. It was like <laughs> the, the rules for high school students say that if you don't go to school, you can't participate in the high school sports. Well, I was like, oh, here's a nice copy. Yep, my high school, school sport is before school. Boom, nailed it. <laughs> and so like that, that was an example or Gosh, um, something that I didn't participate in, but I saw quite frequently was the cheating of sports teams and the like, here's for one example, we'd have like a road trip for the basketball team. And so everybody has to leave school an hour or two early. Well, those kids come in to do a test at lunch. And oftentimes the teacher would just be like, oh, answer keys in the top drawer. I'm going to the coffee shop. And, you know. <laughs> Okay. Really? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. And you know, I wasn't, I was a good enough student that I didn't need to cheat, but I could have absolutely. 
it was right there. You know, could have had those hundred percents, didn't need them, but <laughs> that that kind of stuff. And I say that about the basketball team. I mean, you played with me. You were just a year under me. Our team was okay. We we weren't phenomenal. We weren't terrible. Um, I'd say that the favoritism actually was even greater towards the football team, who was atrociously bad. My senior year, the football team was so bad that they had players literally walking through the halls asking people to join the team to play the games that night. Like, that's how bad the football team was when I was a senior. And so, but those guys, same thing. It was like, oh, got to leave school early. Don't worry about the homework that's due in the second half of the day, you know, that kind of deal. And it's just like, you expect that to some level because that's what we, the society we've been raised in, you know, athletes are glorified, that kind of deal. But at a high school level, I would hope that the kids would be held to at least the same standard as the rest of the students. And that simply wasn't the case most of the time. Yeah, none of us were superstars, that's for sure. No, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. We didn't even go to state my senior year, but it doesn't bother me at all. I was yeah. there to have fun and play basketball with my buddies. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. So speaking of your buddies, have you talked to very many people about Cold Valley Speaks and like, have you gotten any reactions from people? Like are people for it or against it or, or, or what? I don't know. I've seen a little bit of the, the broad spectrum of reactions from the people I've tried to tell about it. Everything from the, oh yeah, this was a problem for me to no, that doesn't happen Cold Valley you know, and, and everything between. Um, my parents actually might fall on different sides of the spectrum, but I'm just working on them. Uh, yeah, gosh, I don't know. The reactions, like I said, have just been so vast and varied. Um, I think the most common reaction is, oh yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I don't know that it's any different than other schools, but yeah, I could see that. Um, and the point I always tell those people is, but it should be different than other schools. You know, Coal Valley wants to pride itself on being a shining beacon of a high school in the Valley. They should be held to a higher standard if that's the case. And, you know, I've heard a lot of people saying things like, maybe these kids are just seeking attention, or if it wasn't, if it was that bad at the time, why didn't they stay? You know, a, a million things. And it's just, I try to convince people to get on and just listen to the stories because not everybody had a good experience like me. Some of the stories are just truly just heartbreaking and horrible and not the kind of stuff you make up. You know, why would you, <laughs> why would you make something up that horrible or that scarred you for life or, yeah. Know, what do you have to gain from telling a fake story? Yeah. Especially when people, a lot of the interviews are telling stories with no names, you know, they're not trying to deface somebody or, you know, the, I, I often tell the people who think that we're out to get Coal Valley that that's not the goal, that the goal is to make Coal Valley a better place than it was or than it is. You know, I don't know how I haven't been connected to the school for the last 11 or 12 years. And so I don't know if things have changed, but the, the ultimate goal here isn't to destroy Coal Valley. And that, that, that's the message that I try to get push on people, especially the people who are like super defensive for Coal Valley. And it's just, I don't know, it's kind of been a process. I'm sure yeah. you know. <laughs> totally. Um, do you think Cole Valley, so you said Cole Valley should be held to a higher standard. And it kind of sounded like you were saying like Cole Valley is no better than public schools. Do you think it's like the same or do you think it's actually worse? Hmm. Gosh, I think that... Uh... High school students are assholes, let's be real. Like, I mean, you're a bunch of teenagers, tons of hormones, ton, no matter what the situation is, you know, you could homeschool five kids and they'd have as much drama, I think. That's just kind of the nature of growing up. But I think that in the best actual example I can give is the difference between the colleges I went to. I went to NNU and Boise State and Boise State's professors were more hands-on and felt like they cared more about me as an individual student. And instead of at a school like NNU or let's associate Cole Valley just loosely, where it's more about the image and the construction of the, the well-being of the group, not necessarily the individual. 
I don't know how, how better to put that. It's but it's it's just because if you create, I don't know, the, the body of Christ or the church and it's healthy, then they assume that it's sprouting new branches and it's good, you know. But that's often not the case. You know, you got to look at the root causes. And I do think it's a problem just in all high schools. There's bullying everywhere. Um, with that in mind, I think Cold Valley has a unique factor of being a Christian school. So we do what I like to call Christian bullying, where it's like, I can get away with saying this. You know, I might, I know, might not want to punch that kid in the face because we'll get detention right away, but I could go rag on him pretty hard. And, you know, then it's a he said, she said. And you, t- you tear people down from the inside is what I saw a lot of at Cold Valley, not necessarily the physical abuse. And there have been reports and stories of physical abuse that was just, you know, under the radar, even in some cases, right in front of faculty. And, but in my personal experience, that was snapped on right away and you didn't get away with that kind of stuff at Cold Valley. So you did the, the under the table kind of bullying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Um, my brothers, I think had similar experiences at Eagle High School where it's just like, yeah, some kids don't get along. Some kids just don't click. And, you know, everybody has enemies and personalities don't match up. But, yeah, I think that happens everywhere, but it's a little bit different at a religious institute. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you mentioned conversations with your your parents. I think that this has been a really interesting thing for – I think this has been actually, like, a really interesting theme of, like, people in the support group. Many of them have said – I finally had my talk to my parents about this today and and they were actually way more supportive of of my perspective than I thought they'd be and that was you know actually some it's brought a lot of parents closer together but there's also been you know some where they're like you know like I'm a lot of people have come out to their parents as as gay or or bisexual or something like that because of this movement and some haven't responded as well as they hoped either. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind, like, what's it been like talking to your parents? Um, so I don't want to get too deep um, just because sure. my mom specifically is, you know, got good friends still that are tied or teachers or, you know, faculty or staff members at even just the churches that are associated. Yep. Um, I will say that initially it was the, I can't believe it, this didn't happen. And but that it's been changing slowly. I, I think that after I brought it up, uh, specifically, I think my dad went and binge watched like every video you had posted at the time or something. And so he did a little bit dig, of d- d- deeper digging there. But they're both, you know, supporters of what Cold Valley teaches. And they're both still practicing Christians, Nazarenes to be more specific. Um, but I don't see. I don't see a huge change happening there. They are sympathetic towards the people who had, you know, bad things happen to them, but don't necessarily think that Cold Valley is to blame or needs to change is what I would say. And that, you know, the the stuff happens at every high school and, you know, the experience would have been even worse if you had gone here and that kind of stuff. But Mm -hmm. gosh, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm working on them. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, you you mentioned uh, being sympathetic. Um, I've heard the perspective related to this movement that um, maybe Christian culture and maybe Coal Valley in particular is good at being sympathetic but not empathetic. Okay, do, you, yeah. do you see a distinction? Like, what do you think about that? Is that a distinction or do you think that's true or, or what's your reaction to that? I would say that there's probably a good bit of truth to that because gosh, in my experience with just religion as a whole, it's really easy to look at a situation that's bad and feel bad about it and pray for it to get better. It's a lot harder to actually do anything about it. And, you know, there's just a very small percentage of believers who do do something about it. Um, I'd say the majority of religious folk that attend church and go to private schools don't do mission trips and, you know, they don't say their prayers every night or whatever. And it's, 
it's a lot easier to say, oh, I feel bad for somebody than it is to actually feel what that person's feeling and do something about making it better. And I, I just think that's rampant in most religions. Yeah. Um, one thing that we've heard a lot is like, well, let's play, like, let's pray about it. Like, do you think that fits in this discussion of like, uh, almost an excuse to kind of pay lip service to something, but not actually do anything? Um, absolutely. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Uh, for me personally, you know, I've had, everybody has bad stuff happen in their lives. There's been a moment for almost every believer where, you know, their entire congregation has prayed for something in their life, you know, that kind of deal. And it never made me feel any better. <laughs> you know, I would have rather had somebody actually like hanging in there with me and doing something about it actively with me, not, oh, I, I pray for you. <laughs> you know, that's, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I'm glad that makes you feel better about yourself. Right. Yeah, I think that, yeah, it's almost like checking a box. Like, okay, like that's off my shoulders now because I like, I did something. Like I prayed. Mm -hmm. In God's hand. Exactly. Hands. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned going into a lot of these interviews, hoping for the best, but expecting something bad. Mm -hmm. What are the, what are some of the positive perspectives of Coal Valley that you think that are, I mean, are there positive aspects of Coal Valley that aren't being represented in these interviews? That aren't already being represented? Yeah, um, we're not enough. Yeah, I'd say yes. Just uh, one thing I want to definitely say is that I truly believe some of the teachers at Coal Valley are there because they love the children and that they're trying to make the world a better place for those children. Um, one teacher specifically came out and said hi to you the other day, I guess is one that always comes to mind with me who yes you know you have however many teachers you have every year but for most students at Cole and most students at any school I'd say there's really only one or two teachers that stand out and connect with you and you feel like they made a positive impact in your life mm -hmm. um, for me one that definitely comes to mind who's actually a member of the support group as well um, is the former choir teacher Claudia Sutherland she changed my life. Like she, she looked at me and saw something in me that I didn't know I had and that nobody else knew I had. And as a result, I got voice lessons and a scholarship to sing in college. And, you know, oh, I, got, I to, know that. got to travel most of the Northwest of our country and a bunch of countries in Europe and all because one teacher at Coal Valley saw something in me that I didn't know I had, you know? And so there, there is that at Coal Valley and it does exist. And I'd say that's the kind of, good message you'd hope that all of the teachers are striving to send is to you know have i've never wanted to be a teacher but if i was i would want students 10 years after i taught them to come back to me and say you changed my life for the better you know and i i, th I think that that does happen uh, maybe more at coal valley than it does at other schools i couldn't tell you i never went to a public school but that's definitely one thing that not everybody at coal valley is evil not everybody's out to get you even the greatest teachers for some people have negative stories with other people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so kind of going back to the praying about it, but not actually doing it, doing anything about it. Is it, what do you think about the fact that, you know, seven, or eight, I think seven weeks after the joint statement's been published, Coal Valley has not accepted our invitations to talk. To me, that's absolutely terrible. Honestly, I expected Coal Valley to contact you on day one of the blog post. Like that would have been, from my experience with Coal Valley, the Coal Valley that you know wants to be better and wants to make their school a safe place, I expected them to contact you immediately. And instead, we received the no comment and the impression that teachers and whatnot had been told not to talk to you specifically. And then we later confirmed that, that teachers and staff had specifically been told not to talk to the movement. 
and it's just kind of frustrating. Like, if I don't know, if they had nothing to hide and they had no wrongdoings, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone type deal. But that's that's not the case, and they know it, you know, and it's it's obvious that they know it. Like, I don't think it does them any good to not speak with the movement to try to make themselves better. And I think that every day they ignore the movement, it gets worse. And more people become more willing to come forward with horror stories and this and that. And, you know, the longer they wait, the worse it's going to get, I think, for Cole. I think their initial reaction was, let's hope this just, you know, runs away and is gone in a week and blows over. And that's actually something that my mom specifically said the first time I told her about is like, oh, this will blow over. And I'm thinking, I don't think so. You know, I I think this is... Even early on, you didn't think it would blow over? No, not at all. Because, you know, I just, I personally know so many people who are disenfranchised with the school. And so there's a lot of stories out there of bad stuff. And uh, I don't know, like I said, I, I think the longer Cold Valley waits, the worse it gets. And, you know, the, the more truly bad dirt will get dug up about Cold Valley, the longer they wait. They, and I believe they should be tackling this head on. Yeah. So, yeah. It's disappointing to me that they haven't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think digging up more dirt, I'm, I'm definitely seeing that because in some ways it's like every, every interview that we do brings like two people off the fence that want to do another interview. And then we're starting to be starting to triangulate like, Oh, I see how those are connected or they're talking about roughly the same thing. And they're in the same year. Like, okay. Like I, yeah, I was there, (laughs) you know? Yeah. So it's definitely a thing. (laughs) Um, So I've got, I've got a couple of my last questions, but was there any topics that you were kind of hoping to cover that we haven't touched on? Um, one thing I would like to mention just specifically is at Coal Valley, I was the kind of student that breezed through that, you know, never studied too hard, never struggled too much, you know, just kind of had it easy at the school. But it was interesting to me that, and this might be true for you too, that in my experience at Coal Valley, the only time that I ever truly felt challenged religiously was at basketball Bible study. You know, why is an extracurricular optional, maybe you go to this Bible study, the safest and best place to ask the truly hard questions? Hmm. And we would, and we would talk about things that you would never talk about in the Bible class at Cole. You know, you talk about sex or drugs or alcohol or whatever. And, you know, even bringing those up in class settings was taboo. And you, you just didn't talk about it where... I feel like a couple of the coaches we had throughout the years and a couple of the the groups of guys, I think a lot of it has to do with the community. Um, We tackled the harder issues out of school and that's, I don't think that should be how it is. Um, Mm -hmm. Just, and on that note, I left Cold Valley feeling like I, you know, I'd done it. I was ready for college. Let's do this. And then I got to college and I realized how totally unprepared I actually was for the real world. And I went to a religious college right away. I went to a school that wasn't that much different than Coal Valley right away. And I was still culture shocked um, because hmm. a, a, a non-denominational Christian, which I, I hate that. But at NNU, it was clear. They were, this is a Nazarene school. This is what we teach. This is our doctrine. But we let other people in. You know, I had friends who were Catholics. There was a girl in my class that was a Wiccan. You know, and we would go to our Bible classes together and discuss it deeply. And that kind of stuff just didn't happen at Cold Valley. It was more like you were being told what to believe, not actually dissecting the religion. And that, that kind of left me a little bit jaded, where it was just, gosh, why didn't anybody tell me this before? Or I, I didn't know that there were, you know, a hundred different types of Christianity, you know, that kind of deal. I... I don't know, was kind of uh, disappointed in the school because of that, where it's like a lot of people took, you know, worldviews or apologetics their juniors and senior years at Cold Valley, 
And it's like, you're just straight lied to. A lot, a lot of the stuff in those textbooks isn't true. And a lot of the, you know, worldview stuff of the, the Christian person was not accurate. And it was really disappointing for me. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from, or what I tell people often, um, and I guess this has changed, but in my upbringing at Cold Alley, we were taught to question things. And it was absolutely the right thing to do to question almost everything. But then this little thing like the internet happened and all of a sudden people could question literally everything. And when you ask the questions and you're looking at answers that are different than what you were told by your teachers, these people who, you know, you, you looked up to, you trusted to teach you, it was kind of frustrating. And it happened a lot on a lot of issues. Um, I know that in one interview specifically, somebody talks about the worldviews book on the chapter about homosexuality and what you know the gay culture is and what those those people are into and it's just like this is not accurate in most cases Um, and and so it was just kind of kind of frustrating and i heard actually uh a girl posted the other day that that seemingly has changed at cold alley and that now it's kind of a culture of don't ask questions this is the way we do it and for me growing up, it was the opposite. It was ask the questions, find the answers, you know, learn for yourself. Um, one of my younger memories at Coal Valley is as a fifth grader, we were singing Jesus Loves Me in music class. And I looked at our music teacher and said, how do I know Jesus loves me? You know, the, the song says Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. Okay. But how do I know? Like, explain this to me. How does this book that's thousands of years old apply directly to me? And the answer was, it just does. And I'm just like, that's not a very good answer. You know, I I expected more. And it just kind of, I don't know, for me, that mindset spiraled. Um, I would have said that all throughout high school, I was a believer. Absolutely. You know, but things, you know, I had questions throughout the years and they challenged my faith. And then I, uh, I probably realistically fell out of the faith and then you actually. So, and that story kind of begins with uh, a really bad breakup where a girl told me God didn't want us to be together. And so I went looking for the religious answer to such a thing. And there isn't one. <laughs> and then uh, eventually that got better, went away or flew over, however you want to say. And then my sophomore year at NNU, we, I got really disenfranchised with the idea of needing to attend church to be a Christian. And there was no, as far as I could tell, religious backing for needing to attend the church to be a Christian. Um, I was at a Nazarene school. Nazarenes believe in the new covenant with Christ. You know, the Old Testament is good, but it's not necessary, you know. And Jesus' teachings is that the church is a group of people, not a place. And so I took a comment card during chapel one day and I wrote on it, you know, why am I required to attend chapel? Why, why is this a thing? And the school chaplain actually like emailed me on my school email and had me come to his office and we sat down and we talked about it and we dug through the scripture and couldn't come up with a reason why I needed to attend a building with this many, you know, however many Christians you want to say in order to be a Christian. Because according to the teachings of the school I was at, the only thing required for salvation was a belief in Christ and, you know, accepting of of Jesus. And so I told him, okay, that is where I'm going to attend the minimum required amount of chapels and then you're not going to see me again. And that was kind of the the beginning of my real falling out with the religions, just okay, I looked for the answer. I tried to find the answer. I know what I've been told all my life and I couldn't find the answer. And so it it led to me starting to question, you know, big picture stuff and kind of just, kind of just falling away slowly. Yeah. (laughs) No, that makes sense. So you mentioned that, um, NNU was more supportive of questions. Mm -hmm. Um, but I thought I also heard you say that your Coal Valley experience was one where critical thinking was encouraged, but I thought I also heard you say that they were like telling you what to believe, not like, is so there I a think that, there? Yeah, I think that there was a change in 
the system of thinking at some point during my time in the Cool Valley. Because definitely elementary school, junior high, maybe like freshman year, it was a open discussion. You know, if you had questions, you asked them and the teachers sought out the answers and gave you the best ones they could according to their faith. Um, by the time I was a junior or senior, it was, this is the way it is because I said so. And that's just, I don't know. It's, uh, I'm sure it's discouraging to a lot of people because not everybody had the, the basis at the elementary and whatnot to know that that was how they used to be. And I, I think that there was definitely a clear change at some point. Um, gosh, I want to say sometime between my eighth and 10th grade years that the, the mentality kind of shifted because I definitely be, I definitely remember as an elementary student being encouraged to ask the hard questions and, you know, seek out answers. And yeah. that was, that was part of the, you know, part of faith and part of believing in God and, you know, living up to the full potential of your mind that he had created and all of this stuff. Uh, and it just like that, that, that style of thinking kind of went away over time is what I, is what I noticed. If you had to speculate on a cause, would you say that it was just, you know, the coincidence of the te the difference in teachers or was this like an administrative thing or, you know, what do you think maybe? Um, honestly, I don't know that I could tell you. I do know that we went through countless administrators in my 13 years at Cole, you know, and some were great, some were not so great, some were of the students and you know buddy buddy and wanted to be your friend and help you with your walk others were militaristic and they were in charge and this is how it's done and everything in between and so it's it's hard for me to say what was going on behind the scenes there but i do think that there was an obvious change in cole christian when they merged with cole valley that was evident and clear to anybody who was there at the time i had I was a fifth grader when the merge happened. I had brothers who were eighth and ninth graders who had to decide all of a sudden if they wanted to go to high school at Cole Valley and if they believed the things that Valley Christian was teaching as opposed to what Cole Christian was teaching. And so, gosh, yeah, I don't know how better to describe that where it's like it was a merging of two worlds almost. What was, if you had, to, and I don't actually have any memories of the distinctions but if you had to summarize like how were the two different you know cold christian and valley christian what were they bringing to the merger like what can you give us any kind of rules of thumb on that um gosh i think that in my memory valley christian was more evangelical than cold christian was and and that was apparent right away and chapels got more sing-songy and it got became more about worshiping and praising God and less about the advanced education we were supposed to be receiving. Um, and on that note, I do believe Cole Valley does offer a good education, you know, in a lot of ways. I, that's the one thing I'm constantly thankful for is that I had the opportunity to take advanced classes at Cole. And, you know, I know people that graduated from public schools in the area who can't add double digit numbers in their head. Or, you know, if I asked them to write an essay, they wouldn't even know where to begin and that kind of stuff. So I'm absolutely thankful for the education I received at Cole Valley as far as like actual just strict studies, you know, but it's more the world preparedness that I don't think we received at Cole Valley. The, mm. the, this is how world, the world works. Like, I will do that you know that, that kind of thing it might have been a week in econ class or you know life skills should be a bigger focus at a school like cold alley where mm -hmm. they're trying to teach you to live a christ-centered life you know that's that's way more than just book learning to me. yeah and so no, i was gonna yeah i was gonna push back on you and say that you said that you didn't feel prepared for college but you said you got good education um is that more about like kind of how the world works? Not absolutely. Yeah. It, it wasn't about what I knew. It was about how I knew to apply it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was absolutely a font of information when it came to how to write or advanced calculus or that kind of stuff. But when it came to how to actually function as an individual in a brand new setting with a thousand people, you don't know, there was no way, no way. 
And then it was, you know, oh, all of a sudden I have, I'm responsible for my own meals and I need to do my laundry and I need to do taxes. And like the real, the real world started catching up and hitting you. And it's just like, nobody ever told me about this. I, I feel like this should have been part of my curriculum. And uh, yeah, so I just kind of was flabbergasted at just how unready for life I was. I was ready for the education level. The, the work was not too hard. Mm -hmm. the more responsibilities and that kind of stuff that are just associated with getting older and going to college or getting a job or whatever you choose to do after high school. That is the part that I was not ready for. Yeah. Got it. So. Okay. Well, um, is there anything else that you wanted to mention before I have my last few questions? Hmm. Nope. Go ahead. Shoot. Cool. <laughs> So if Coal Valley Administration watch, watches this uh, video, what, do you, what message do you have for them? Um, I would tell them to contact Cameron because <laughs> I don't know that there's a better... Is that punting? Talk to Cameron. <laughs> I, I would say that I don't know that there's a better bridge, at least in my time at Coal Valley, than a student like yourself because you know, you're already a name at the tip of their tongues and they can know that you're a responsible adult who will listen to what they have to say. Um, the longer they wait, the worse it gets. The more bad stories come out, the more people want to dig into what's truly bad. And let me tell you, if, if Coal Valley is you know, guilty of actual illegal stuff, people are going to find it. Like, that's, that's just the truth. Uh, there have been some stories about you know, bribes and that kind of stuff. And, that's illegal. That, that's hard illegal. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd really hate for the school to end up getting destroyed trying to avoid being destroyed because that was never the goal initially of this movement. You know, we just, we want to make coal better. Not all of us had a horrible experience there, but we recognize that others did. And so I, I really don't understand why the administrators just refuse to talk. Yeah. Right. And if you, um, if you were talking to parents that were thinking about putting kids in Coal Valley, what do you want them to hear? I would tell them that if you insist on it, be involved, be beyond involved. The more involved you are, the better experience your student will have. But then on top of that, don't force a kid to go to Coal Valley. You know, it's not for everybody. You know, some kids aren't safe there and that's just the truth at this point. Um, so, your young adult student is growing up and you should include them in that kind of decision. So if you guys come together and you decide that yes, Coal Valley is for us, you know, make sure you read the mission statement, make sure you understand what the, you know, students and teachers technically sign the pledge of faith or whatever it is. Make sure you read it because I found stuff in there that I didn't know. Um, and just, like I said, the more involved you are, the better. Be the parent that drives the carpool. Be, be the parent that's at every basketball game. Um, be the parent that's in the teacher's ear about group projects or whatever. Just the, the more present you are as a parent, the better experience I think your kid will have at Cole. As a way to like counteract the crazy bullshit or as a way to just like, uh, uh, Find, like find ways that you can kind of supplement. Uh, so in the current system, I'd say it's as a way to increase your child's Coal Valley privilege level. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that that's the stick. Case for the school, the more the teachers respond to and interact with the, the student themselves. Mm -hmm. So, like for, for me, for example, I was one a legacy where I had had older brothers that had had almost every teacher growing up. And so a lot of the teachers knew me as Mr. Arnold before I even stepped a foot in their classroom. Um, and some teachers called me Mr. Arnold out of respect. Some people thought it was a joke. And so, you know, but that, that level of interactivity between my older siblings and my parents made my overall experience better. And so I'd say that that's very important is to be involved and know exactly what you're signing up for. If you don't agree with the statements of faith, don't go. That, that's all I, because as far as I can tell, Coal Valley still 
tells people that they're a non-denominational Christian school. Well, for a non-denominational Christian school, they have some very specific views. Make sure you agree with them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's a good, great point. Um, and what do you want current students to hear? Um, current students, I'd say if you're struggling and if it's the kind of stuff that teachers can't be talked to about, reach out to the support group. That's, that's literally why we're here. Um, if you're the kind of student who, like me, is having a good time in high school, you know, and you're on the sports teams and singing in the choir and you're a student president, you know, look around you, look at the kids who aren't and do what you can to make their life better. Because that is really what the faith is supposed to be about is enriching each other's lives, not enriching your own. And so that's what I would tell that, like I said, the, the disenfranchised kid, reach out. The kid who's having a great time, reach out to one of the disenfranchised kids. Look around, make a new friend, you know, sit with somebody at lunch, invite somebody to a party. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's really that easy to make life better. Yeah, oh, that's great. Kyle, thanks. Thanks for all your points of view. Um, it's, it's super helpful, and I, I'm, uh, I'm glad to add it, add it to, the, to the multitudes. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to have been here. Hopefully, yeah. I, I know quite a few people who had similar experiences to me who haven't reached out because they don't think they have anything to say. Um, do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you, if you come across somebody, tell them to do it. Tell them I'm looking. I want to talk to them. I will. All right. I appreciate you having me. Yep. Talk to you later, man. Thanks. Bye. Bye.